Madam Speaker, okay. I'd like to know what do you think is the biggest threat to Minnesota right yeah. now? How can we unite around that mm -hmm. and work together, all of us? Mm -hmm. What would be your strategy for solving it? Well, I think probably our largest threat to Minnesota right now is the lack of vision about where we are going in the next 10 and 20 years. And mm -hmm. I think that the next governor needs to have a vision of where we're going to be, an investment in early childhood education that's going to help all children, the economic development plan for the entire state of Minnesota. And it's been sort of a very narrow vision we've been living with here. And I think that's the biggest threat to Minnesota, is that we have been narrowed by the vision of Tim Plenty, and we really need uh, a bigger vision of Minnesota leading the way. How can you get more Minnesotans to work with you and solve that together? Oh, I think Minnesotans very much want to work on this vision. Uh -huh. This is what I hear when I'm traveling the state. Minnesotans want this sort of leadership. So I think Minnesotans are ready to go. I think it's been the leadership at the very top in the governor's office that's been limiting them. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. Right. I think, what do you see as Minnesota's biggest threat? And how can we unite around it and solve it? What would be your strategy for trying to get around that threat? How can we get to it? Well, as I've traveled around the state, people often come to me and say, you know, you're the Senate tax chair. You probably understand the state's budget challenges better than the other candidates do. What's the state's biggest problem? Uh -huh. And when you don't say anything, almost immediately everybody will say, I'll bet it's the budget deficit, isn't it? Hmm. And the truth is, the budget deficit is not the state's biggest problem. It's a symptom of a larger problem. And the, the larger problem that the state has is we have an economy that is underperforming really badly. And the consequence of that is we've got 170,000 people unemployed. Uh, our income tax collections just last month in October were $58 million below forecast. Uh, the next governor is going to have to be, uh, I would call him a uniter, a problem solver. Somebody who can bring in the business community, bring in the labor community, uh, bring in suburban and urban and rural interests and figure out how we can get Minnesota's economy going uh, so that uh, we have the revenue to invest in things that we think, uh, I think that all Minnesotans think it, are important. It sounds like as well as identifying a problem, it sounds like you say that the problem is almost our strategy. Well, I think that's probably true. Uh, you know, the state does have severe challenges and, you know, just like in somebody's home or in a community, uh, when, you, when you confront serious challenges, everybody kind of has to huddle together and figure out how you collectively take it on. And I would argue that Minnesota's challenges are big enough right now that uh, people need to think about checking their partisan stripes and start thinking about the future of Minnesota. What kind of Minnesota do we want to live in? And uh, that's going to require a new tone at the Capitol. And I would argue that in those discussions, the governor is really, really important because the governor really sets the tone at the legislature. And Governor Plenty has set a pretty partisan tone. Uh, we've had a lot of gridlock because of that. You know, he's wanted things his way and been unwilling to compromise with the Democrats who control the legislature. So the, the, a lot of the work hasn't gotten done. Mm -hmm. And uh, the tone that the next governor sets, because of the challenges we face, are going to have to be, uh, it's going to be much different, much more inclusive as we try to confront Minnesota's challenges uh, collectively. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to ask you, what do you think is the biggest threat to Minnesota? What can we unite around and try and solve? And what do you think would be your strategy for trying to do that? Well, I'd say the core four issues are jobs. We have to put 216,000 Minnesotans back to work. We need to increase funding for public education, K-12, higher education, early childhood. We need to make our tax system progressive again. I know a few Republicans won't agree on that, but we've got to make the wealthiest people in Minnesota pay their fair share of taxes again. And then I believe we need national single-payer health care, so we take the profiteering out of health care and we put every dollar back into caring for people. What would be your strategy then for getting these things done? Well, to get elected first. Yes. <laughs> uh, I'll go to work like Rudy Perpich all over this state, this country, this world, to bring jobs to Minnesota. I'll propose an economic stimulus package that will use our resources at the state level in terms of a state bonding bill to put people back to work, increase the funding for highway construction, uh, mass transit. National single payer, I'll lead the way in Washington and I'll uh, expand public option here in Minnesota so that we uh, lead the way for the rest of the country in, in making health care universal coverage for everybody, uh, taking the insurance profiteering out and making it affordable for all of our citizens. I'll make progressive taxes uh, about passing through the legislature a tax bill that will increase taxes on the wealthiest 10% of the people of Minnesota. People can afford to pay their fair share. You can read my lips, tax the rich, and uh, 
they ought to be paying more, not less as they are today under Tim Pawlenty's tax shelters. So they ought to be paying their fair share of taxes. And I'll put that additional money into K-12 education, higher education, early childhood education, and uh, I'll make a promise as governor I will increase state funding for public education every year I'm governor. There'll be no exceptions and no excuses. Thanks very much. I'd like to ask you this question. What is the, the biggest threat right now, do you think, to Minnesota? And what could we unite around and really work and focus on together? And what would be your strategy for that, Steve Kelly? Well, I think the biggest challenge Minnesotans face is that uh, we have a sense that we can't get things done working together. We've had 11 years, basically, of failed leadership in the governor's office. And we need an opportunity to bring Minnesotans together around some large calls. And they ought to be around some other challenges that we face. But the biggest challenge, the one that overrides all of them, is this lack of confidence that we can do anything by working together. So I believe the next governor has got to bring people together and say, yes, there are things we can do. We can close the achievement gap. We can make sure that all Minnesotans have affordable health care. We can do something today to make sure that we don't leave our children a warmer planet uh, through the result of human uh, interference in the atmosphere. We can do things today that will help our children be better off, we will put people back to work, um, but also make sure that we're delivering justice to our future I think future that's a really interesting answer because it seems like you're sort of focusing on the strategy more than any single problem because you're saying that our strategy is almost failing every problem. Well, the, the inaction and the lack of leadership is having a, an effect on every problem. Our schools are floundering. Uh, we are cutting people off their health care, doing a range of things. We, we start off talking about uh, climate change. We set these big long-term goals, and we don't do anything today to begin the process of actually accomplishing those goals. And I think we have to restore people's confidence that we can do things today to actually achieve those goals. It is our greatest threat to Minnesota right now. What can we unite around and solve and how would, what would be your strategy for doing that? Well, the, the most important thing we have to do is bring our state together to solve our problems, period. Hmm. All of them. It's not like we can't solve our problems. You know, if, if modern political movement, politicians of the modern era were running the abolition campaign a hundred years ago, we'd still have slavery, but we'd be proud of the fact that they only had to work 40-hour work weeks. Uh -huh. and, and, you know, with health care, it's not rocket science to provide health care to everyone. Thirty other countries in the world do it. And that's why we have to tackle the problems that we've been just ducking on. We can't keep deciding to provide insurance for more people. 40,000 last year, 70,000 a couple years ago. We're not getting anywhere. We need to solve the problem. The Minnesota Health Plan, my legislation now has 70 co-authors in the legislature. It would take, take the issue and provide it as a right, something that people get. They don't have to qualify for. They don't have to fight for. They don't have to fight insurance companies because we don't have insurance companies under it. We have health care. And that's just one example. But, I mean, I think what we have to do as a society is bring people together and tackle the problems. That's a really interesting answer to me because, in a way, you're not saying that there's a single problem. You're saying that the strategy is the problem. The strategy, it's, again, people, progressives have gotten to the point where we don't believe in ourselves anymore. We think we're not going to be able to solve the problems. I say that's, that's no good. I mean, for 30 years, we've been letting Republicans kick at us and take apart our society and our common good. No, we don't have to do that. We can actually solve the problems. How and can we un re 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 unite, or unite us, John Marty? How can we unite the society and so on? Well, I think mm -hmm. it's, it takes leadership. Mm -hmm. You know, just one quick example on health care again, with covering undocumented people. The president said we couldn't do that because it was politically indefensible. And he gets beat up on that. And then they say, OK, well, then we won't even provide them the option to buy it privately. Well. That doesn't work. I mean, we're not going to let people just bleed to death on the streets. We, what we do now is we take them to the emergency room where we'll it's We'll pay for expensive. it one way or the other. That's exactly right. So what I'm saying is let's start figuring out how we bring people together, how we solve the problem. What I think is politically indefensible is the knowledge that there are people, because they came from some other country, who might be serving us burgers at McDonald's or Taco Bell or whatever. They may have infectious diseases, and we say we're not going to treat them. I mean, what kind of public health does that provide? That's the way you get diseases spreading around. With the flu, we want everybody to be covered. And it's cheaper that way. It's cheaper to cover them up front than it is to wait till they use the emergency room. And so that's the thing where if we as a society, if we as progressives start talking in the right way and start trying to figure out how we solve the problem instead of doing political calculations about everything. I mean, if, 
if you start with the political calculation and then try and figure out a public policy that will work around that, you're not going to get anywhere. But any great social change movement of the past, civil rights, women's suffrage, people didn't figure out what was politically saleable and then, then decide what they were going to do. They decided what was the right thing, what was the thing that was important to do. And that's why healthcare is a perfect example. Living wage jobs. I mean, the fact that there are homeless people now who are working, full-time workers who have home, are homeless. You know, we can tackle those problems. We just have to start with the idea, what's the goal? Affordable housing for everyone, okay? Living wage jobs for everyone. Then how do we structure that way? How do we structure a tax code to address that? So, in my mind, the simple answer to your question is, it's not just the issues, it's how we tackle them and mm. how we're willing to fight on them. I think that's great. Thank you very much. Well, I think the biggest threat, if you want a threat, is the unallotment process the governor used and the mm. fact that I think it's totally unconstitutional what he did and that the legislature should have come out swinging immediately after he did it and challenged his uh, uh, right to be able to do that and his violation of what I think is our constitutional authority to not only raise and uh, decide how money's spent but to uh, write laws which right now he's actually writing laws. I don't know where he's getting this authority and nobody's really taken them on. What would be your strategy for, for fixing that? Well, I asked leadership in early June to uh, think about a lawsuit. I wanted to bring a lawsuit. Uh, senator Tomasoni, my, my senator and I, and the Range Association of Municipalities and Schools and a few individuals sued the governor over on allotment in 2003. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we didn't win, but it was a whole different issue. It was about whether a fund called the 21st Century Mineral, Minerals Fund uh, where general fund money had been transferred into that special account, whether or not it was general fund money and the governor could on a lot. But this is a whole different issue. This is a usurping the authority of the legislature. And for people to sit around idly and not do anything about it, to me is, uh, you know, I don't understand it. It's uh, incomprehensible to me. Uh, right now, a governor, any governor, whether the governor is Tom Rukavina or Tim Pawlenty, can basically sign every spending bill and then decide to unlock. Do you think he's making some of his decisions for um, his future and not for Minnesota? Well, I don't think the governor's been making any decisions for Minnesota for the last uh, three years. <laughs> and in fact, uh, you know, uh, he's been missing in action here for the last six months or almost for six months. And uh, uh, I think the people of the state of Minnesota are getting fed up with him. I don't think he could, well, he's never won an election with a majority of the votes in Minnesota. So I don't know where he's coming from uh, and what he's thinking when he th thinks he can be president of the United States. But, you know, that's his, that's the, I guess that's his uh, dream to pursue. But he's got a job to do in Minnesota and he should come home and do it. Because what he's doing right now with his borrowing that he's decided to do this week is borrowing from our kids' future so he can have a political future. And I think that's not only wrong, but I think it's somewhat it hypocritical. It sounds sort of against his own amendment. Yeah, well, it sounds like, you know... I think he's been very insincere in his, uh, uh, his claim that he loves his state and loves the people of his state because what he's doing to them is not where I come from, any sign of love. What do you think is the biggest threat right now to Minnesota? What will join us together to really work and try and solve yeah. that problem? And what's your strategy for doing that? Clearly right now, in the middle of the worst economic catastrophe since the Depression, we have to create jobs. And the good news is that we've shown in Minneapolis that you can do that by investing in the workforce, by investing in small business, by innovating with, with good new growing businesses. The unemployment rate when I took over in Minneapolis was 1% higher than the suburbs. Today that's totally gone. We've filled the second largest building in the state in the Sears building. We've done dramatic new improvements and new businesses opening on our commercial corridor. We put 10,000 people through our employment and training programs. We can do this. We can even put 2,300 kids to work last summer, 80% of them kids of color. All that can be done if you have leadership that understands how to get results, that has a progressive vision, but is also about tough, strong management. Minnesota needs to get back to work. We've done it in Minneapolis, and that's what I want to do in the state. Hmm. Thanks a lot. Good. What's our biggest threat, and how can we unite around that and solve it? What's your strategy for that? Well, I think the biggest, like many things, the biggest threats are also the biggest opportunities we have, and I think hmm. there's really three of them. The first is the age wave and what that means for healthcare in particular. Uh, and the second is environmental challenges that Minnesota has to be a partner with. And the third is the changing economy and that we're globalizing and we have to compete in that. I think in that third one with the globalizing of the economy, 
it seems to me we have to keep a, uh, we need to get Minnesota riding the wave of the, where the growth is going to be, and that's really focusing on our export economy, and we can do a lot more with that, especially in the near term, you know, as other parts of the world, South America and Asia, increase their economic growth quicker than the United States is going to, we should be pushing as many of our products there and starting to ride that wave as they start to get How can you get prosperous. Minnesotans to unite around these? Well, I think that, first of all, it creates jobs here, which yes. is our number one issue that we have to take care of. Uh, the second thing is we're already doing it. We have a tradition of doing it, and the state can play a role with not that much money, which is another good thing to unite around, in terms of providing technical assistance about how you actually go about doing it. You know, it's not just the 3Ms and the cargos that have to do it. It's the small and medium-sized businesses, and I think there's some really exciting opportunities there. Um, around the age wave, uh, you know, I think that's something I've been really working hard on uh, in the legislature and we've passed some good legislation to get communities starting to plan and I think there's so much wisdom uh, in our in older Minnesotans and so much that they can offer if we could just tap into that a lot more effectively it would serve all of us uh, really really well and um, and the last thing on the environmental stuff you know again it's a huge economic uh, opportunity and I think that's how you sell it to Minnesotans it's it's about um, uh, creating locally grown energy sources. It's creating smaller uh, generation using local renewable resources that can create the kind of, not just uh, meet the energy needs locally at a pretty inexpensive rate, uh, but also start to drive innovation among Minnesotans again. And it's not just going to be the wind turbines, it's going to be thermal uh, energy, it's going to be solar energy. Uh, and those are areas where the rest of the world hasn't done as much work and I think huge opportunities economically for Minnesota hmm. as well. So it's it's really focusing on what's good for our economy and what's good for all of us. It's the win-win kind of things that we really need to focus in on. Thanks very much.